Book Three, Part Two, of The Art of War by Niccolo Machiavelli, translated by Henry Neville. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Clive Catterall. Book Three, Part Two. Ventidius, coming to battle with the Parthians, the virtue of whom, in great part, consisted in their bows and darts, he allowed them to come almost under his encampment before he led the army out, which he only did in order to be able to seize them quickly, and not give them time to fire. Caesar, in Gaul, tells that in coming to battle with the enemy, he was assaulted by them with such fury that his men did not have time to draw their darts according to the Roman customs. It is seen, therefore, that being in the field, if you do not want something fired from a distance to injure you, there is no other remedy than to be able to seize it as quickly as possible. Another reason also caused me to do without firing the artillery, at which you may perhaps laugh, yet I do not judge it to be disparaged. There is nothing that causes greater confusion in an army than to obstruct its vision, whence most stalwart armies have been routed for having their vision obstructed, either by dust or by the sun. There is also nothing that impedes the vision more than the smoke which the artillery makes when fired. I would think, therefore, that it would be more prudent to let the enemy blind himself than for you to go blindly to find him. I would, therefore, not fire or, as this would not be approved, because of the reputation the artillery has, I would put it on the wings of the army, so that firing it, its smoke should not blind the front of what is most important of our forces. And that obstructing the vision of the enemy is something useful, can be adduced from the example of Epaminondas, who, to blind the enemy army which was coming to engage him, had his light cavalry run in front of the enemy so that they raised the dust high, which obstructed their vision, and gave him the victory in the engagement. As to it appearing to you that I aimed the shots of the artillery in my own manner, making it pass over the heads of the infantry, I reply that there are more times, and without comparison, that the heavy artillery does not penetrate the infantry than it does, because the infantry lies so low, and the artillery is so difficult to fire, that any little that you raise them causes them to pass over the heads of the infantry, and if you lower them, they damage the ground, and the shot does not reach the infantry. Also the unevenness of the ground saves them, for every little mound or height which exists between the infantry and the artillery impedes it. And as to cavalry, and especially men-at-arms, because they are taller and can more easily be hit, they can be kept in the rear of the army until the time the artillery has fired. It is true that often they injure the smaller artillery and the gunners more than the latter, to which the best remedy is to come quickly to grips. And if in the first assault some are killed, as some always do die, a good captain and a good army do not have to fear an injury that is confined, but a general one. And to imitate the Swiss, who never shun an engagement, even if terrified by artillery, Rather, they punish with the capital penalty those who, because of fear of it, either break ranks or by their person give the sign of fear. I made them, once it had been fired, to retire into the army, because it left the passage free to the companies. No other mention of it was made, as something useless once the battle has started. You have also said, in regard to the fury of this instrument, that many judge the arms and the systems of the ancients to be useless. And it appears from your talk that the moderns have found an army and systems which are useful against the artillery. If you know this, I would be pleased for you to show it to me, for up to now I do not know of any that has been observed, nor do I believe any can be found. So I would like to learn from those men for what reasons the soldiers on foot of our times wear the breastplate or the corselet of iron and those on horseback go completely covered with armour, since condemning the ancient armour as useless, with respect to the artillery, they ought also to shun these. I would also like to learn for what reason the Swiss, in imitation of the ancient systems, form a close company of six or eight thousand infantry, 
and for what reason all the others have imitated them, bringing the same dangers to this system because of the artillery as the others brought which had been imitated from antiquity. I believe that they would not know what to answer. But if you ask the soldiers, who should have some experience, they would answer, first, that they go armed, because even if that armour does not protect them from the artillery, it does every other injury inflicted by an enemy, and they would also answer that they go closely together, as the Swiss, in order to be better able to attack the infantry, resist the cavalry, and give the enemy more difficulty in routing them so that it is observed that soldiers have to fear many other things beside the artillery, from which they defend themselves with armour and organisation. From which it follows that, as much as an army is better armed, and as much as its ranks are more serrated and more powerful, so much more is it secure. So that whoever is of the opinion you mentioned must be either of little prudence, or has thought very little on this matter. For if we see the least part of an ancient way of arming in use to-day, which is the pike, and the least part of those systems, which are the battalions of the Swiss, which do us so much good, and lend so much power to our armies, why shouldn't we believe that the other arms, and other systems that they left us, are also useful? Moreover, if we do not have any regard for the artillery when we place ourselves close together, like the Swiss, what other system than that can make us afraid? Inasmuch as there is no other arrangement that can make us afraid than that of being pressed together. In addition to this, if the enemy artillery does not frighten me when I lay siege to a town, where he may injure me with great safety to himself, and where I am unable to capture it as it is defended from the walls, but can stop him only with time with my artillery, so that he is able to redouble his shots as he wishes, why do I have to be afraid of him in the field, where I am able to seize him quickly? Uh, so I conclude this, that the artillery, according to my opinion, does not impede any one who is able to use the methods of the ancients, and demonstrate the ancient virtue. And if I had not talked another time with you concerning this instrument, I would extend myself further. But I want to return to what I have now said. Luigi said, We are able to have a very good understanding, since you have so much discoursed about artillery, and in sum, it seems to me that you have shown that the best remedy one has against it, when he is in the field and having an army in an encounter, is to capture it quickly. Upon which a doubt rises in me, for it seems to me the enemy can so locate it on the side of his army, from which he can injure you, and would be so protected by the other sides, that it cannot be captured. You have, if you will remember, in your army's order for battle, created intervals of four arm lengths between one company and the next, and placed twenty of the extraordinary pikemen of the company there. If the enemy should organise his army similarly to yours, and place his artillery well within those intervals, I believe that from here he would be able to injure you with the greatest safety to himself for it would not be possible to enter among the enemy forces to capture it. Fabrizio said, <laughs> You doubt very prudently, and I will endeavour either to resolve the doubt, or give you a remedy. I have told you that these companies, either when going out or when fighting, are continually in motion, and by nature always end up close together, so that if you make the intervals small, in which you had placed the artillery, in a short time they would be so closed up that the artillery can no longer perform its function. If you make them large, to avoid this danger, you incur a greater, so that, because of those intervals, you not only give the enemy the opportunity to capture your artillery, but to rout you. But you have to know that it is impossible to keep the artillery between the ranks, especially those that are mounted on carriages, for the artillery travel in one direction and are fired in the other. So that if they are desired to be fired while travelling, it is necessary before they are fired that they be turned. And when they are being turned, they need so much space that fifty carriages of artillery would disrupt every army. It is necessary, therefore, to keep them outside the ranks, where they can be operated in the manner which we showed you a short time ago. But 
let us suppose they can be kept there, and that a middle way can be found, and of a kind which, when closed together, should not impede the artillery, yet not be so open as to provide a path for the enemy. I see that this is easily remedied at the time of the encounter, by creating intervals in your army which give a free path for its shots, and thus its fury will be useless. Which can be easily done, because the enemy, if it wants its artillery to be safe, must place it at the end position of the intervals, so that its shots, if they should not harm its own men, must pass in a straight line, and always in the same line, and therefore by giving them room, can easily be avoided. Because this is a general rule, that you must give way to those things which cannot be resisted, as the ancients did to the elephants and chariots with sickles. I believe, or rather, I am more than certain, that it must appear to you that I prepared and won an engagement in my own manner. Nonetheless, I will repeat this, if what I have said up to now is not enough, that it would be impossible for an army thus organized and armed not to overcome, at the first encounter, every other army organized as modern armies are organized, which often, unless they have shields or swordsmen, do not form a front, and are of an unarmed kind which cannot defend themselves from a nearby enemy, and so organized that, if they place their companies on the flanks next to each other, not having a way of receiving one another, they cause it to be confused, and apt to be easily disturbed. And although they give their armies three names and divide them into three ranks, the vanguard, the company or main body, and the rear guard, nonetheless they do not serve for anything else than to distinguish them in marching and in their quarters. But in an engagement they are all pledged to the first attack and fortune. And Luigi said, I have also noted that in making your engagement your cavalry was repulsed by the enemy cavalry and that it retired among the extraordinary pikemen, whence it happened that with their aid they withstood and repulsed the enemy in the rear. I believe the pikemen can withstand the cavalry, as you said, but not a large and strong battalion, as the Swiss do, which in your army have five ranks of pikemen at the head, and seven on the flank, so that I do not know how they are able to withstand them. Fabrizio said, Although I have told you that six ranks were employed in the phalanxes of Macedonia at one time, nonetheless you have to know that a Swiss battalion, if it were composed of a thousand ranks, could not employ but four, or at most five, because the pikes are nine arm lengths long, and an arm length and a half is occupied by the hands, whence only seven and a half arm lengths of the pike remain to the first rank. And the second rank, in addition to what the hand occupies, uses up an arm length of the space that exists between one rank and the next, so that not even six arm lengths of pike remain of use. For the same reasons there remain four and one half arm lengths to the third rank, three to the fourth, and one and a half to the fifth. The other ranks are useless to inflict injury, but they serve to replace the first ranks, as we have said, and serve as reinforcements for those first five ranks. If, therefore, five of their ranks can control cavalry, why cannot five of ours control them, to whom five ranks behind them are also not lacking to sustain them, and give the same support, even though they do not have pikes as the others do? And if the ranks of extraordinary pikemen, which are placed along the flanks, seem thin to you, they can be formed into a square, and placed by the flank of the two companies which I place in the last ranks of the army from which place they would all together be able easily to help the van and the rear of the army, and lend aid to the cavalry, according as their need may require. Luigi said, Would you always use this form of organization when you would want to engage in battle? Fabrizio said, Not in every case, for you have to vary the formation of the army according to the fitness of the site, the kind and numbers of the enemy, which will be shown before this discussion is furnished with an example. But the formation that is given here, not so much because it is stronger than others, which is in truth very strong, as much because from it is obtained a rule and a system, to know how to recognize the manner of organization of the others. For every science has its generations, upon which in good part it is based. One thing only I would remind you, 
that you never organise an army so that whoever fights in the van cannot be helped by those situated behind, because whoever makes this error renders useless the great part of the army, and if any virtue is eliminated he cannot win. Luigi said, and on this part some doubt has arisen in me. I have seen that in the disposition of the companies you form the front with five on each side, the centre with three, and the rear with two, and I would believe that it should be better to arrange them oppositely, because I think that an army can be routed with more difficulty, for whoever should attack it, the more he should penetrate into it, so much harder would he find it. But the arrangement made by you appears to me results that the more one enters into it, the more he finds it weak. Fabrizio said, If you'd remember that the Triari, who were the third rank of the Roman legions, were not assigned more than six hundred men, you would have less doubt, when you leave that they were placed in the last ranks, because you will see that I, motivated by this example, have placed two companies in the last ranks, which comprise nine hundred infantry so that I come to err rather with the Roman people in having taken away too many than few. And although this example should suffice, I want to tell you the reasons, which is this. The first line of the army is made solid and dense, because it has to withstand the attack of the enemy, and does not have to receive any friends into it. And because of this it must abound in men, for few men would make it weak both from their sparseness and their numbers. But the second line, because it has to receive the friends from the first line who have withstood the enemy, must have large intervals, and therefore must have a smaller number than the first. For if it should be of a greater or equal number, it would result in not leaving any intervals, which would cause disorder. Or if some should be left, it would extend beyond the ends of those in front, which would make the formation of the army imperfect. And what you say is not true, that the more the enemy enters into the battalions, the weaker he will find them. For the enemy can never fight with the second line if the first one is not joined up with it, so that he will come to find the centre of the battalion stronger and not weaker, having to fight with the first and second lines together. The same thing happens if the enemy should reach the third line, because here he will not only have to fight with two fresh companies, but with the entire battalion. And as this last part has to receive more men, its spaces must be larger, and those who receive them lesser in number. Luigi said, And I like what you have said, but also answer me this. If the five companies retire among the second three, and afterwards the eight among the third two, it does not seem possible that the eight come together and the ten together, and are able to crowd together, whether they are eight or ten, into the same space which the five occupied. Fabrizio said, The first thing that I answer is that it is not the same space, for the five have four spaces between them, which they occupy when retiring between one battalion and the next, and that which exists between the three or the two. There also remains that space which exists between the companies and the extraordinary pikemen, which spaces are all made large. There is added to this whatever other space the companies have when they are in the lines without being changed, for when they are changed the ranks are either compressed or enlarged. They become enlarged when they are so very much afraid that they put themselves in flight. They are compressed when they become so afraid that they seek to save themselves not by flight, but by defence, so that in this case they would compress themselves and not spread out. There is added to this that the five ranks of pikemen who are in front, once they have started the battle, have to retire among their companies in the rear of the army to make space for the shield-bearers who are able to fight. And when they go into the rear of the army, they can serve whoever the captain should judge should employ them well whereas in the front, once the fight becomes mixed, they would be completely useless. And therefore the arranged spaces come to be very capacious for the remaining forces. But even if these spaces should not suffice, the flanks on the side consist of men and not walls, 
who, when they give way and spread out, are able to create a space of such capacity which should be sufficient to receive them. Luigi said, The ranks of the extraordinary pikemen, which you place on the flank of the army, when the first company retires into the second, do you want them to remain firm and become as two wings of the army, or do you also want them to retire with the company? Which, if they have to do this, I do not see how they can, as they do not have companies behind them with wide intervals which would receive them. Fabrizio said, If the enemy does not fight them when he forces the companies to retire, they are able to remain firm in their ranks, and inflict injury on the enemy on the flank, since the first companies had retired. But if they should also fight them, as seems reasonable, being so powerful as to be able to force the others to retire, they should cause them also to retire, which they are very well able to do, even though they have no one behind who should receive them, for from the middle forward they are able to double on the right, one file entering into the other, in the manner we discussed when we talked of the arrangement for doubling themselves. It is true that when doubling they should want to retire behind, other means must be found than that which I have shown you since I told you that the second rank has to enter among the first, the fourth among the third, and so on, little by little, and in this case it would not be begun from the front, but from the rear, so that doubling the ranks they should come to retire to the rear, and not to turn in front. But to reply to all of that which you have asked concerning this engagement as shown by me, it should be repeated, and I again say that I have organised this army, and will again explain this engagement to you, for two reasons one, to show you how the army is organised, the other, to show you how it is trained. As to the systems, I believe you all most knowledgeable. As to the army, I tell you that it may often be put together in this form, for the heads are taught to keep their companies in this order. And because it is the duty of each individual soldier to keep well the arrangement of each company, and it is the duty of each head to keep well those in each part of the army, and to know well how to obey the commands of the general captain. They must know, therefore, how to join one company with another, and how to take their places instantly. And therefore the banner of each company must have its number displayed openly, so that they may be commanded, and the captain and the soldiers will more readily recognise that number. The battalions ought also to be numbered, and have their number on their principal banner, one must know, therefore, what the number is of the battalion placed on the left or right wing, the number of those placed in the front and the centre, and so on for the others. I would want also that these numbers reflect the grades of positions in the army. For instance, the first grade is the head of ten, the second is the head of fifty ordinary validi, the third the centurion, the fourth the head of the first company, the fifth that of the second company, the sixth of the third, and so on, up to the tenth company, which should be in the second place next to the general captain of the battalion. Nor should anyone arrive to that leadership unless he first has risen through all these grades. And, as in addition to these heads, there are the three constables in command of the extraordinary pikemen, and the two of the extraordinary veliti. I would want them to be of the grade of constable of the first company. Nor would I care if they were men of equal grade, as long as each of them should vie to be promoted to the second company. Each one of these captains, therefore, knowing where his company should be located, of necessity it will follow that, at the sound of the trumpet, once the captain's flag was raised, all of the army would be in its proper places. And this is the first exercise to which an army ought to become accustomed that is, to assemble itself quickly, and to do this you must frequently each day arrange them and disarrange them. Luigi said, What signs would you want the flags of the army to have, in addition to the number? Fabrizio said, I would want the one of the general captain to have the emblem of the army. All the others should also have the same emblem, but varying with the fields or with the sign, as it should seem best to the lord of the army but this matters little so long as their effect results in their recognising one another. But let us pass on to another exercise in which an army ought to be trained, which is 
to set it in motion, to march with a convenient step, and to see that, while in motion, it maintains order. The third exercise is that they be taught to conduct themselves as they would afterwards in an engagement, to fire the artillery and retire it, to have the extraordinary Veliti issue forth, and after a mock assault, have them retire. Have the first company, as if they were being pressed, retire within the intervals of the second company, and then both into the third, and from here each one to return to its place and to so accustom them in this exercise that it becomes understood and familiar to every one, which, with practice and familiarity, will readily be learned. The fourth exercise is that they be taught to recognise the commands of the captain by virtue of his bugle calls and flags, as they will understand without other command the pronouncements made by voice. And as the importance of the commands depends on the bugle calls, I will tell you what sounds or calls the ancients used. According as Thucydides confirms, whistles were often used in the army of the Lacedaemonians, for they judged that its pitch was more apt to make their army proceed with seriousness, and not with fury. Motivated by the same reason, the Carthaginians, in their first assault, used the zither. Aliatus, king of the Lydians, used the zither and whistles in war. But Alexander the Great and the Romans used horns and trumpets like those who thought the courage of the soldiers could be increased by virtue of such instruments, and cause them to combat more bravely. But just as we have borrowed from the Greek and Roman methods in equipping our army, so also in choosing sounds should we serve ourselves of the customs of both those nations. I would, therefore, place the trumpets next to the general captain, as their sound is apt not only to inflame the army, but to be heard over every noise more than any other sound. I would want that the other sounds existing around the constables and heads of companies to be made by small drums and whistles, sounded not as they are presently, but as they are customarily sounded at banquets. I would want, therefore, for the captain to use the trumpets in indicating when they should stop, or go forward, or turn back, when they should fire the artillery, when to move the extraordinary veliti, and by changes in these sounds or calls, point out to the army all those moves that generally are pointed out, and those trumpets afterwards followed by drums. And as training in these matters are of great importance, I would follow them very much in training your army. As to the cavalry, I would want to use the same trumpets, but of lower volume and different pitch of sounds from those of the captain. This is all that occurs to me concerning the organisation and training of the army. Luigi said, I beg you not to be so serious in clearing up another matter for me. Why did you have the light cavalry and the extraordinary Veliti move with shouts and noise and fury when they attacked? But they, in rejoining the army, you indicated the matter was accomplished with great silence. And as I do not understand the reason for this fact, I would desire you to clarify it for me. Fabrizio said, When coming to battle, there have been various opinions held by the ancient captains, whether they ought either to accelerate the step of the soldiers by sounds, or have them go slowly in silence. This last matter serves to keep the ranks firmer, and have them understand the commands of the captain better. The first serves to encourage the men more. And, as I believe consideration ought to be given to both of these methods, I made the former move with sound, and the latter in silence. And it does not seem to me that, in any case, the sounds are planned to be continuous, for they would impede the commands, which is a pernicious thing. Nor is it reasonable that the Romans, after the first assault, should follow with such sounds, for it is frequently seen in their histories that the soldiers who were fleeing were stopped by the words and advice of the captains, and changed the orders in various ways by his command, which would not have occurred if the sounds had overcome his voice. End of Book 3